Okay, folks. So I wanted to share uh, this interesting post. My husband sent me a screenshot from the Nextdoor app here in Henderson, and uh, I don't use it myself. I, I tried using it a few years ago, um, but I got into a conversation with this really ignorant person about some of the policies and things going on here with the whole green agenda and removing green spaces and stuff. And that was like two or three years ago. It seemed to me like the app itself was nothing but this social engineering project to, that it was already infiltrated with people who were just completely brainwashed with all of the mainstream ideas. So anyway, that's a whole nother video, huh? I just thought this was kind of curious because uh, she talks about how she was in need of some thoughts on a certain situation that happened about a week or so ago. And this was within the last four days, within the last week uh, here. And she says, I had firefighters on the roof of my apartment complex, and then they went on the roof of the building across mine, and then again a couple of days later on the roof of the building across the way, and then again today. After the first time, I called the leasing office, and he said, don't worry, they're just training. Right away, I was like, that's super weird. Don't they have their own training buildings, and why would they train in a residential area? And they're fully suited too, masks on and some tank thing on. Also, I, I don't know, just I feel something off also note this all started a day after i found mold in two bedrooms which that's another story i need some thoughts and advice on also thought it weird the fire department came out this morning as it rained all day yesterday maybe there's something going on my apartment complex doesn't want to say does anyone know if firefighters actually do train in apartment complex with residents or is my apartment complex trying to gaslight me so I think that's kind of curious. And if we look at Center Street, it stretches here from Bird Holder all the way up here to uh, one of these little side streets, Fullerton. And I believe the apartment complexes are located right here because most of this down through here is all just regular housing from my observance. Um, so it would be right here in these apartment complexes over in this area here. There's apartment complexes here where Warm Springs Road is too. And this was the area where they had the whole carjacking incident recently, too, by the way, which uh, that ended up, that was over here, uh, like six, seven blocks away. This is Golden Glow Court right here. This is the little area where the hijacker ended up. Um, I just think that it's curious that the firefighters would be up on the roofs of some of these apartment complexes over here in this area with some of the recent events that have occurred even in this area not just a car hijacker but there was the incident where somebody had shot themselves while going down the road and they were traveling you know towards lake mead and they ended up in this ditch they ended up in the ditch over here uh i or right here it might have been right on the corner by lake mead but um i just think it's curious that firefighters would be training for you know whatever reasons on i agree with this lady it is kind of interesting that they would be training while there's residents in there and would they really tell anybody if there was any kind of a threat of any kind? Not. But um, it, it is interesting to me with a lot of this housing that's going up around us, too. They are putting up all kinds of housing. And now this is some updated Google Map stuff because uh, all of this right here, this is all new housing that was just built within the last two years. Um, and I do have older Google Maps footage that I've compared it to. So they... I think those recent mappers were mapping all of this out to provide Google with some updated imagery for housing and stuff. And I, I bet it's probably got something to do with our state leaders and those in charge of affordable housing. See, this way they can go and they say, look, we got these Google shots that show, look at all of this new housing, affordable housing we've put up. And they're putting it up pretty much all the way around us here. If I scroll out and go down over here to where Boulder Highway is, they've already added in all of these newer Beezer and Juniper homes been added into, because this was all bare. There wasn't no housing over here when I first got here. And it's just really built up a lot just in the last two years. So um, I think that's kind of curious. They're putting up all of this housing all the way around us. And a lot of this housing down in here, I mean, our neighborhood, the Terravita over here and then the Cinnamon Ridge over here, these areas, you know, have the terracotta roofing. You know, it's not like shingles and all that. It's the terracotta roofing. But when you go across the way to the older neighborhoods, a lot of these other older houses in this area have the old shingled roofs. And they wouldn't necessarily be up to any of the current standards and current codes. Let's say 
And now I'm going to dangle out it out on the old conspiracy tree branch a little bit and just, you know, observe and take note and document that this entire area over here, right in here, this is all older type housing that has older type roofs. It has the shingles and they have the big air conditioning AC units sitting on the top. And it's not exactly, you know, weatherproof or climate change proof, if you want to say. Um, so if something were to happen, you know, like some kind of a natural disaster or something involving like static electricity, you know, because we're so dry out here, you know, um, and this were, were to be destroyed and burnt down, uh, I don't think that it would break a whole lot of those corporate people's hearts. But I really don't. And it, when you talk about an area this big right here, this is a very large area of real estate property. Okay. And you're close to Lake Mead and the Lake Mead foothills. And you're close to, you know, the whole Las Vegas strip paradise. I mean, this area here, the real estate value of it is very grand. We'll say that. And when you look at the ratio of owner occupied property in here, um, they're outweighed by property management. And when you have property management companies that are told by the government per federal regulations that they need to update their property and update, update their, you know, their houses and their buildings and their structures on their property to meet current standards and current codes, they're looking at, you know, pretty extensive, you know, cost to the property management to be able to bring it up to code. But, you know, if something were to happen and something were to come through and cause something really, you know, devastating to happen and just burn it all out, so to speak, um, then they would qualify for emergency funding. It wouldn't cost them very much and they could just build it back better, right? I'm just saying it, it wouldn't be the first time that tactics like that had been used. And coincidentally, too, um, you can see there's still a lot of housing being built up right up to the edge of these hills and out in this area here. This is where they wanted to put, you know, that um, eastern corridor through. And let's see. Uh, the With virtually everyone against it, NDOT scraps the option to run I-11 through the Lake Mead Rec area. And this was back in 2021. And now back at the time when they were doing the public comments on this, I went through and printed out a few different, you know, notices and made sure people around in these neighborhoods knew that they were attempting to put this corridor right through, you know, the Henderson area. And you could see right here's where the proposed marks were. I know I have that. Let me find that screenshot. I know I have it in here somewhere. There it is. Yeah, if we look down in here in this area along the Lake Mead foothills, this was the proposed area where they wanted to put that big super highway through. And if we look on the Google Maps, you could see it's right in through here where there's more housing. There's people buying up these little lots and putting up more houses and ranches and different things. And, you know, there's people out in this area here, too, that have horses. There's like little horse ranches and stuff and little chicken farms and stuff up in this area, too. But these people spoke up when it came time to public comment about that eastern corridor coming in and coming down in here along the Lake Mead Post. And they, they were forced to scrap it. But I guarantee you they had already spent grant money. There were already contractors and people contacted about it. And they already had plans in place to want to do it. And they, they will get their way eventually. I know they will. It's just how it works. They want to put in that eastern corridor. They want to be able to go from this area up here to the north around the Lake Las Vegas area and be able to go back down here to the south and be able to travel through from this space up here in Nevada area down into, you know, Arizona and to the 95 and into California area without having to come through the Las Vegas Strip and go through, you know, here. They want to have that shortcut. And I guarantee you there are people that are already working hard to make sure that they get that. They want that little shortcut that goes, you know, from the north to the south without having to, you know, go through Las Vegas area. And anybody that's here in the way of it, they don't care about you. You. They really don't. They don't care about us. They really do not give a shit about us. Okay. 
And like I said, because I'm repetitive, I got to say it again. The fact that they're going through and issuing all of this federal money for property managers and for people to go through and upgrade their systems and upgrades their buildings and their structures on their properties to meet current standards, which are climate change um, tolerant, I guess you can say. Uh, you know, when you put a bunch of money out there, there's a lot of greedy people and there are people that will just take, take, take without even thinking twice about the residents and the people that live here. And like I said, because I'm repetitive, I'll say it again. They don't care if there was some kind of a natural disaster or something, if you want to call it that, to come through and just wipe all this housing out. They don't care. That would actually be a bonus because then it would open up more federal funding for more repairs and to build it back better if they wanted. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't trust any of these people in charge of some of these systems when it comes to upgrading, you know, for climate change. Really? That's your excuse. You couldn't come up with anything better. It's climate change, right? And fires can be started with static. You can create static fires. It's already been proven through um, when we talk about prescribed burning, which is done, you know, for forestry reasons and for land management. Um, prescribed burning is controlled burning and they can absolutely control it. And a lot of times they create these fires and they burn ahead of these fires using certain techniques, which involve electro static energy. It's very similar to lightning. They produce lightning strikes to cause fires in certain areas. Okay. As a, as a man, as a, a means of land management and forestry management. And through sciences and all kinds of stuff, they've already concluded that you can start fires through static fires. If you have an area that's already dried out and you have high winds that come through and you have dead brush and tumbleweeds and dead trees and stuff around, when that wind picks up, it starts rustling all of that stuff that's dead. And it's like rubbing two sticks together to start a fire. It's this static fire. And it happens quite often. And it's one of the things that was mentioned in several of forestry management prescribed burn um, PDF files where they describe the way that the ways that they start the fires and the tools that they use to start the fires and how it's based on a naturally occurring event, an eccentric event, as it's described, that can occur in an area that has got high winds and a lot of dead brush, rub two sticks together, boom, you have a static fire. And again, these people just don't care. I don't, it's interesting to me too, that um, Michigan is going to power up that power plant, the Palisades power plant is getting uh, put back online. The Department of Energy is giving $1.52 billion to uh, bring the Palisades nuclear plant back online. And if you're not familiar with that, it's over here in, on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan and Palisades power plant and it was closed down just like just maybe a couple years ago is when they had closed it down yeah back in 2022 back in may of 2022 it was shut down and i just and now they're gonna they're gonna power it back up again i just think that people should be mindful because they talk a lot of like a political type of a thing and a money cost thing uh as a reason for shutting it down but it, it's also talks here about uh, shut down the plant early due to the performance of a control rod drive seal. So just stay mindful because it's obvious they're they're moving forward with whatever agendas they want to move forward. And they really don't give a shit about people. They really don't. And they're flooding, you know, all of these in parts of industry with so much federal funding that people are they're just wanting pieces of that pie. They just want a piece of that pie, just like everyone. But just stay mindful back there in Michigan, folks, because I don't think that this is going to be the only instance where they're going to be um, putting some of these power plants that they had already shut down for various reasons back online. I just, I don't trust them. Like I said before, because I'm repetitive, I just got to say it again. I just don't trust them. I mean, we even talk, this is a an article that was put out concerning a new forest fire paradigm and the need for high severity fires. I mean, this this you got this chick here, and this was from 2012, um, talking about how um, these fires may indeed be catastrophic when measured by losses of human lives and property. However, 
severe fires in wildland areas are both natural and necessary to maintain the integrity of dynamic disturbance adapted forest systems. We propose a change in the current paradigm, which holds that severe forest fires are always harmful to a new one that embraces their ecological necessity. This chick is making a case for having severe fires. Okay, when a fire begins, Crews are deployed by the responsible agency to cut fire breaks or set up intentional burns that move in the direction of the fire's front line, depriving it of the fuel it needs to advance. Under extreme weather conditions, such as strong winds and high temperatures, fires are difficult to control. So firefighters often focus instead on protecting structures and evacuating vulnerable areas. Pre-fire treatments, such as logging and prescribed burning to reduce fuel load, are widespread in managed forests. And it, I mean, she goes on in this article to talk about all of the benefits and all of the post wildfire, severe wildfire survivors and what we can learn from the animals that survive these really severe, you know, fire events. And it's just, to me, it, it it's just, I don't understand when people come out with these types of articles like that, where exactly they're coming from and who exactly they're pitching this idea to, if not those in control of the prescribed burning and choosing which areas get the severe burnt and controlled prescribed burns, you know, I just, I don't know. She goes on here uh, changing the fire paradigm. Land management agen agencies have long embraced the ecological role of low severity fire and forest ecosystems. That is to maintain sparse open stands of larger trees by burning grasses and litter and killing smaller trees. Yet high severity fire continues to be viewed negatively by some land managers and the general public. We're like, yeah, how dare us be against high severe, severely damaging and devastating wildfires? They got to change that paradigm though, right? These attitudes are reinforced by the Smoky Bear ad campaign of the U.S. Forest Service and the National Association of State Foresters. So there you go. Don't listen to Smokey the Bear. He's been misinforming us. Videos and posters teach the public that the only good fires are prescribed, low severity fires that recreate the beneficial effects of natural ones while avoiding catastrophic losses associated with uncontrolled fires. This message, along with management directives promulgating suppression of high severity fires, persists despite evidence that the creation of abundant snag dominant dominated stance that occur in the wake of severe fire are critical to many species in Canada and the Western U.S. So in other words, now is the time to recognize the critical ecological value of severely burned forests so that the public and the agencies under its trust can begin to accept and even welcome mixed and high severity fires. This can be accomplished by collating the extensive body of scientific literature on the importance of post-fire habitats and the harm caused by snag removal in these systems and by making this information easily available to decision makers and the media. Scientists and forest biologists working in fire-adapted forest ecosystems need to become effective spokespeople for the new paradigm. Some forest managers have begun to recommend retaining some stands of severely burned forests in their management plans. For example, the Sierra Nevada Forest Plan Amendment in California proposes guidelines for retaining at least 10% of severely burned forest stands during post-fire logging operations, and actual retention rates have often been higher than that. These are promising recommendations, but unfortunately, because they are not based on a thorough analysis of the habitants required to sustain fire-dependent species, it is not clear whether 10% retention is high enough to ensure that the protected areas contain the density and variety of snags needed to provide adequate foraging, substrate, and nesting and shelter opportunities for wildlife. So in other words, we need to change our fire paradigm and be more accepting of severe fires. In fact, encouraging more severe prescribed fires, which, which she admits can't be controlled. I'm just over it. These people in charge of some of these things and the scientists these days are fucking wackadoos, if you ask me. I would just be very mindful if you live over here in this area with all this older housing. I'd be mindful if you live in an area that has older style roofs. Because they're going through and they're revamping all of this stuff and they're offering all kinds of federal money through the Department of Energy to upgrade certain systems on our on our power plants and everything too, to meet this so-called energy demand. 
I don't understand Las Vegas. You're talking about having to meet an energy demand that you're putting in all, you know, that's the reason and excuse that they're given that they need to put in all of these solar power plants and all of this shit. But you're going to put through a high speed electric rail system. You know, that's priority there. They got their priorities all in line here. I'm telling y'all. I mean, right down to advertising for curling, for a new curling venue, which requires, well, never mind. I digress. People are whack dudes. I don't get it. Stay mindful, folks, or you just may lose your mind.